I want to talk about today. Let me just mention some comments that uh, I'd like to make after yesterday's lecture. So if you recall, um, one of the things that I talked about and discussed the, some of the ideas and the proof of the theorem that the figure eight knot is the only arithmetic knot. in the three sphere. <clears throat> so it's a very interesting question that I spent some time thinking about and had some of my students think about and I think it makes some very interesting projects for other students is to try to understand the class of um, one cusp arithmetic hyperbolic three manifold. So the couple of the knot in the three sphere is a one cusp hyperbolic three manifold and so maybe the question could be formulated, um, you know, we want to understand you know, arithmetic knots in closed orientable three manifolds, i.e., if M is such a manifold, consider K and M a knot so just an embedding of a circle into the, the closed three manifold such that the complement of this knot in the three manifold looks like the quotient of H3 mod gamma so it has a hyperbolic structure of finite volume but moreover um, and gamma is arithmetic that's the punchline so that's perhaps one slightly vague question that arises, try to understand these arithmetic knots. And um, one precise question that one might ask if one felt daring, and I asked myself this around about the time when I was thinking about the figure eight knot complement being arithmetic, was, well, perhaps it's true that, that um, does every closed orientable three manifold contain an arithmetic knot? Now, I've been thinking about this question before Perlman proved the Poincaré conjecture. And in fact, if, this, if the answer to this was yes, this would actually imply the Poincaré conjecture because, in fact, the proof that I give to show that the figure eight knot's the only arithmetic knot in the three sphere proves that the figure eight knot's actually the only arithmetic knot complement in a homotopy three sphere. And so if this had a positive solution, then I would have made a lot of money because of certain, certain clay. However, of course, once one's seen that that's a reasonable approach to the Poincaré conjecture, it's bound to be false. And of course, it is false, so the answer is no. And, but yet, the answer being no doesn't really kind of explain exactly what's going on for the collection of manifolds that contains arithmetic knots or not. So it, it was a theorem of Mark Baker and myself that proved that lots of lens spaces have no arithmetic knot. More precisely, if you have a lens space LPQ where the fundamental group has odd order and that order is not five, then there's no arithmetic knots in those lens spaces. So if um, so L PQ with P odd and not equal to 5, do these have no have no arithmetic knot. In the case of P equals to 5, there are two examples of not complements that are arithmetic. So for example, if you take if you take this example, so if we start with one of the links from yesterday, the Whitehead link, 
and we surge her, and I think I can never remember the, if it's plus 5 or minus 5 on that component. But anyway, this surgery on one component here, this is arithmetic. So this looks like H3 mod gamma. And gamma uh, is contained inside the Bianchi group, PSL203. So this is what's called the sister of the figure 8 knot. So surgery on this unnoted component gives a length space. That's the point of this picture there. So there are lots of length spaces that don't have arithmetic knots, and there's lots of other kinds of non-hyperbolic manifolds. So other examples. Examples, one could take connect sums of length spaces. So L, P, I, Q. So we could take a finite collection of length spaces, take their connect sums, and so long as P, I is large, so let's just make it bigger than 37, then there's no arithmetic notes. But again, this seems kind of a weird family, and in particular, Length spaces are not hyperbolic, and connect sums of length spaces. These are not hyperbolic manifolds. And it's, it's been a rather perplexing and irritating open problem that I would really, I'm sure it has to be true, and I'm sure it's generically true, but I don't know how to do this. Just give me a single example of a closed hyperbolic three manifold that contains no arithmetic knot. So it can. So does there exist? I mean, I shouldn't put it like this, because uh, generically this has to be the case. A closed hyperbolic three manifold with uh, no no arithmetic note. So as I said, I would expect the typical close hyperbolic three manifold to contain no arithmetic knot because having such a knot complement forces you to be commensurable with a Bianchi group and that's a very kind of strong property. Now Craig mentioned in his talk today theorems about how the degree of the invariant trace field behaves under Dane surgery on a knot for, exa for example and what's kind of really needed here is somehow going the other way. What happens to the degree of the invariant trace field when one drills out say geodesics out of a closed hyperbolic three manifold. So this is kind of a, a good question. As I said, you know, you may not impress all your friends with it, but if you answer it, but you'll certainly impress me if, if, you, if, you, if you can answer this. So this is a good, a good sort of good question to think about for, for lots of reasons somehow. So that's kind of one thing that comes out of the discussion here. So, that, so S3 contains this arithmetic knot that's very, very nice. And another thing that comes out of this is that there are, in fact, um, examples of closed through manifolds that contain more than one arithmetic node. So there are examples. Let's, let's, let's just call this, let's call this, you know, one. Oh, maybe. So, so maybe that's the first part of the question, in the first part of the discussion. And the second part is that there exist closed three manifolds that contain more than one arithmetic node. So, for example, um, e.g. S2 cross S1 contains at least two. And this is, was done using the census that Craig has been discussing and Walter mentioned in his talk. And um, one can use SNAP to kind of get information. And if, so in this case, we have that S2 cross S1. There are two examples here. And they, they occur for different Bianchi groups. So occurring for D equals 3 and 7, those are the ones that we have in the census. And then um, another example is the connect sum of two length spaces. L41 connects sum L41 also has at least two arithmetic notes. And here it's just they both arise when D is equal to 7. So this uniqueness here for the figure 8 note is clearly kind of a special thing. There are some examples where there's at least two. But um, you know what, what's going on here? So for example, 
Another kind of open question that I'd just like to mention is, um, are there only finitely many arithmetic knots in a closed orientable three manifold? So are there only are there only arithmetic knots in a fixed M. And I don't really know what to expect there. I mean, uh, as I indicated yesterday, that so we have one cusp manifolds, that's what we're talking about, and we were lucky in the case of the figure eight note that everything went on inside a Bianchi group, and so we got down to a finite list of Bianchi groups that one needed to consider from class group reasons. It's also true that there are only finitely many commensurability classes of Bianchi orbifolds that can contain a one-cusp orbifold in the commensurability class. That's a slightly harder result to prove. So there are only finitely many commensurability classes that these arithmetic knots can arrange themselves, but nonetheless, um, at present, um, after much trying, and um, every time I think about it, I get depressed because I can't solve it, so I have to wait for, an, for a lengthy period of time before I go back to it. So, again, this is, this is kind of a good question, I think, as well. Okay, so that was just from the discussion of, from yesterday. So, um, so now what I'd like to do is, is move on and talk about um, some of the other topics that I mentioned right at the start of the, the lecture yesterday. So if you remember the kind of topics that I'm interested in here in this, in this series of lectures are, you know, covering spaces of arithmetic things, and we've been discussing, you know, special classes of covering spaces with these not complements. Um, abundance of symmetries that we discussed yesterday, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that today in a more general setting. And then the other topic was the structure of the set of geodesics in arithmetic hyperbolic manifolds. And that's what I want to talk about um, next. So, again, let's just uh, recall the picture that we have. So, here's our, our hyperbolic three manifold, and here's some geodesic G that's in the, the hyperbolic three manifold, and here's the, the universal cover, H3. And so we see all these lifts of G to the universal cover, etc. And again, as we discussed last day, that, that we can think of G as being given by fixing attention on one of these geodesics, and we find that there is a, an element here for uh, which this is the axis. So this, the axis of some element the gamma that's translating up this axis with translation length, the length of the closed geodesic G. So this guy here projects down to this closed geodesic G. So, the element gamma here, so we have the element gamma in gamma that's hyperbolic. So closed geodesics correspond to conjugacy classes of hyperbolic elements in the group gamma. So hyperbolic just means that gamma is conjugate in PSL2C. To uh, something of the form lambda, zero, zero, lambda inverse. So these are the eigenvalues as we discussed last day. And um, so long as lambda's not the absolute value one, this will give us some hyperbolic element.
And recall an element, sometimes this is called luxodromic, and recall an element is called purely hyperbolic if, well, the lambda turns out to be real. Okay, so this element is, so gamma is purely hyperbolic. if um, lambda is an addition real. So the, kind of the difference here is that this guy, the purely hyperbolics, they really do just strictly translate up the axis, whereas these other guys here, they can twist around as they go up the axis that they're translating along. And in any event, um, the, the length of g, this geodesic that we get is twice the absolute value twice the logarithm of the absolute value of lambda. So here again, lambda is organized to be the eigenvalue bigger than 1. Now, when we have these closed hyperbolic 3 manifolds, or you know, finite volume hyperbolic 3 manifolds, um, the elements in there, apart from the identity, well, they could be parabolics if there's cusp, but the, the typical element is hyperbolic. And um, you may wonder, well, you know, What's the distribution, say, between you know, hyperbolic versus purely hyperbolic? They, they can't all be purely hyperbolic because then you have to be Fuchsian. So the thing I want to prove, and I'll, I'll state the vague version first, theorem, let's put it like this, in quotes, first of all, is that most arithmetic Kleinian groups <laughs> contain no purely hyperbolic elements. Now, and this has some interesting consequences that I'll mention in a minute or two. So, well, what's most going to mean? Well, well this theorem here is going to be a consequence of a more general proposition, and there are various ways that one can state this, and one can tweak the hypothesis a little bit. But here's a very kind of clean statement that does enough for what we want maybe here. So this will, so, so, so a more precise statement that we want. And again, what I'm going to do now is state this in the framework of just arbitrary closed hyperbolic three manifolds. You know, Walter in his first lecture introduced the invariant trace field and the invariant quaternion algebra associated to those finite volume hyperbolic manifolds, and so we can make statements about these quaternion algebras, etc. So the proposition is the following, is that suppose, so let's let gamma be a Kleinian group of finite covolume, So covolume just means the quotient, H3 mod gamma, that's finite volume, and assume that gamma satisfies the following. So the first thing is that uh, the invariant trace fields should contain no proper subfields other than Q. So K gamma contains different from Q. And secondly, um, that the invariant quaternion algebra should be ramified at a real embedding of this guy. So A of gamma ramified at a real place of the invariant trace field. And then the punchline is that groups with this property, they cannot have any purely hyperbolic elements. And we'll discuss the proof of that. It's kind of a very nice application of the arithmetic techniques. So let me just make a couple of comments here. So being ramified in a real place means already that you know, k of gamma has a real embedding. So that's one thing to say. And then the other thing is the fact that we're ramified at a real place means that um, 
we're talking about coke and pack things because Walter said in his first lecture that if you're non coke and pack, so you have parabolic elements, you have the matrix algebra, and you can't be ramified at any place by the local global picture. So I know you're all sitting on the edge of your seats waiting for the punchline, so then um, gamma. There's no purely hyperbolic elements. So all of these elements have twist along their axis. And in fact, more than that's true, the twisting can't be just kind of, you know, looking like going like e to the 2 pi i over n for some number n. So you can't have rational multiples there, too. OK, so let's, let's, so let's just make a corollary array just to from this statement up here. So in particular, um, what kind of examples could we, we know exist? So the, the idea here is here a statement's really about a field and an algebra. For, for non-arithmetic things, it's perhaps harder to construct this, but you just go into snap and you see examples for which you can do this fairly easily. But the fact is the arithmetic machine tells us that you, know, you give it a field and you give it an algebra, then you get groups. So here, we could just take k of gamma to have you know, prime degree, for example, 3 over Q, and just take A gamma to be the algebra that, you know, gives us arithmetically defined guys. So, so a corollary of this is that if gamma is arithmetic, and say, let's just say K gamma over Q is 3, say, or, you know, or prime, then gamma has no purely hyperbolic elements. So an example that's been talked about here of such a manifold is the, the Weeks manifold. In, in fact, Walter described the quaternion algebra this morning associated to the Weeks manifold. It was defined over a cubic extension of the rationals and ramified at a single finite place. OK, so let's go ahead and prove this theorem. Now, so let's assume that we have gamma, and it contains some purely hyperbolic element. call that little gamma. Now, again, because powering a purely hyperbolic remains purely hyperbolic, it makes sort of sense from the point of view of the construction. And this is things that have come up time and time again. This passage from you know, the trace field to the invariant trace field involved passing from a group gamma to the group generated by the squares of elements. And that's kind of the better group to, to consider. So uh, since since gamma, since powering, since powers of a purely hyperbolic is purely hyperbolic, we can just, just assume that, um, let's say, gamma is just equal to gamma 2, OK? So you know the fact that this group always tends to be a better group to work with from the point of view of these arithmetic constructions. So now, what is the point of the hypotheses that we've given on the, on the algebra? So we have a real embedding that's given to us. OK, so we have so k gamma has a real embedding. And in particular, um, let's just consider, um, let's just consider this real embedding here. So we've got zig, let's let sigma 
go from K gamma into the reals. Now, what do we know about the trace of a hyperbolic element, a purely hyperbolic, beg your pardon? It's a real number. So let's let T be the trace of gamma. And so this is real by the purely hyperbolic assumption. Now, furthermore, being purely hyperbolic, and so it's real trace, it's inside the group gamma. So in fact, T belongs to K gamma. So in fact, this implies then that T belongs to K gamma intersect R. And this is Q by the assumption number one there. OK, there are no proper subfields other than Q. So we've got a real element in that group, so that can't generate the whole of this field because it's a complex number field, as Walter pointed out in his lecture. So this must be in Q. So if sigma is a real embedding, um, well, sigma restricted to Q is the identity. So sigma restricted to Q is the identity. So therefore, um, the I sigma of restricted to Q of trace of gamma is just equal to, well, the identity of trace of gamma, which is trace of gamma, of course. And again, we have that the absolute value of the trace of gamma is bigger than 2. Now then, what does this part here tell us? We've got the fact that the quaternion algebra is ramified. So ramification, again, meant that at the, in place sigma, we see the Hamiltonian quaternions. And if you remember yesterday, the discussion that all of these traces on the, on the left-hand side, as it were, to do with the quaternion algebra, go over to the traces, etc., either in the matrices or the Hamiltonians. So if we think about the condition that we're ramified at sigma, in fact, that tells us that when we look at sigma of trace of gamma, that has to be bounded above by 2 because it's a trace in the Hamiltonian quaternions. So however, um, A gamma is ramified at sigma. And so this implies that sigma of trace of gamma is less than or equal to 2. Again, that follows from the naturality of these traces that we have on, on these uh, quaternion algebras. And so that's therefore a contradiction. Here it's bigger than 2, and here it's less than or equal to 2. So therefore, there can't be any purely hyperbolic elements in this, in this group. So a consequence of this, therefore, that's interesting, is a corollary with, with gamma as in the hypothesis. There are no Fuchsian subgroups of this group gamma because Fuchsian groups have got purely hyperbolic elements. So gamma as in the theorem, or proposition rather, implies gamma contains no Fuchsian subgroups. And I'll come back and speak a little bit more about this statement here when we start talking about topology of finite sheeted covers because this is relates to certain kinds of surfaces that live inside the three manifold. But for now, let me just leave leave it at that. So here's a nice kind of very clean condition that guarantees that we have no purely hyperbolic elements and hence no Fuchsian subgroups inside our, our Kleinian group of finite covolume. And it's very hard geometrically to kind of do these kinds of things. I mean, it's very difficult to recognize, you know, when a Kleinian group does or doesn't contain a Fuchsian group geometrically. It really typically uses these kinds of algebraic statements about the quaternion algebra and the number field. OK. So that's one discussion about the geodesics in a arithmetic hyperbolic three manifold. 
The next thing I'd like to talk about is um, the structure of the set of lengths of closed geodesics in a an arithmetic hyperbolic manifold um, and how much information that tells you about the manifold. So now we want to study that. <coughs> so there's a very classical object that's been studied a fair amount. It's called the length spectrum of a hyperbolic manifold. So let's let M be, let's just think H, let's just think with H3 mod gamma for now, be um, finite volume. Then we can talk about more general hyperbolic manifolds. Then the length spectrum of uh, of M. Well, this is the collection of all lengths of closed geodesics together with multiplicity. So you look at the, there's the shortest closed geodesic. It's got length one. There may be 17 geodesics of length one. So you would, you would take, okay, I'll record length one and 17. You go to the next shortest guy. Maybe it's got length 100 and there's just one of those. So you take length 100 together with one, etc. So this is the, the collection of all lengths of closed geodesics together with the multiplicities of these closed geodesics. So the length spectrum is a kind of complicated object, but it does seem to be a rather powerful tool in recognizing a hyperbolic manifold. And let me just tweak this a little bit. Instead of looking at the spectrum of such things where we include multiplicities, I'll just look at the length set. So the length set, this is just uh, sort of M. This is just a set of all lengths of closed geodesics. So we forget about the multiplicities. So this is the collection. Now, the length spectrum of M is known to determine the volume of M. So that's a very powerful piece of information. And you may wonder, well, OK, we're just looking at the sets of closed geodesic, but we've tossed away the, the multiplicities. You know, what, the, what does this really tell you? Well, in fact, it turns out there's results of Walter and myself and Chris Leininger and Ben McReynolds that prove if you drop the multiplicities, then all hell breaks loose. So you can get manifolds with the same length set, but totally different volumes. So some of the multiplicities are kind of the, the key thing that's kind of guaranteeing the volume is the same in that case. So the question is, you know, how, how much does this tell you about the manifold? So again, as we've been discussing, a natural context for all of this stuff we're talking about is commensurability. So, so the question Um, do uh, hyperbolic three manifolds with the same length sets? Well, sorry, are are hyperbolic three manifolds with the same length sets commensurable? So in particular, having the same length set, you're, you're, you've got, well, having the same length spectrum implies you've got the same length set. So you could put up the length spectrum here as well if you wanted. Now, the, the examples that I mentioned of Walter and myself and Leininger and McReynolds, these all just arise from covering spaces. So they really are commensurable. The collections of examples for which the manifolds are known to have the same length spectrum they are also known to be commensurable. These are kind of very 
interesting constructions. There are arithmetic constructions that go back to Vinyara, and then there's beautiful constructions that are fairly general due to Sunada that was kind of mimicked uh, on what goes on for number theory. So um, what I'd like to talk about is indeed a theorem that says that if you have arithmetic hyperbolic three manifolds with the same length sets, then they are commensurable. So the theorem, in fact, I'm not going to talk about this theorem, I'm going to talk about a two-dimensional version because this one's, this one's too hard to present in public, but it, we, have the, we have the ideas. So this is Chinberg. Um, who else was it? Chinberg. Oh, yeah. Hamilton. Long. And myself. That says the answer is yes for arithmetic hyperbolic three manifolds. And one of the interest in this statement has been that, in fact, as I mentioned, there was these constructions of Vinyara and Sunada, and they were looking at isospectrality. So instead of looking at the length spectrum, say, one looked at the spectrum of eigenvalues that one got from the laplace beltrami operator on the manifold, and the eigenvalue spectrum is the eigenvalues plus multiplicity, and it's known that that determines the length set. So a corollary of this is that um, if you have isospectral arithmetic hyperbolic three manifolds, that they have to be commensurable. So as I said, I'm not going to talk about the proof of, of this theorem. There's a fair amount of number theory that goes in at some point to get some additional control. The key issue is somehow that, you know, just being given the lengths, you forget about all the twisting that goes on as you go up the geodesic. And as I've just tried to indicate, you know, most of these arithmetic things, that's what's going on. They have lots of twisting as they go up, translate along their geodesics. So somehow being able to recover that holonomy as you twist up a geodesic just from lengths, that's really what we're kind of saying here as well, is kind of tricky. So what I'm going to do is prove this in the case of two dimensions. So I'll need to introduce arithmetic Fuchsian groups. So we'll give the proof. Yeah, length sets. In fact, yeah. In fact, one can do even better than that. One can take what's called the rational link set. So just as long as you know that the two link sets are rationally related, then, then you get it. So, um, okay, so let's just, let's just digress for a minute. arithmetic Fuchsian groups. So we were talking about arithmetic climbing groups. Fuchsian groups, those are the guys. So this is going to be going on inside PSL2R now. And so the machine is exactly the same as what Walter described in his first lecture, except that, well, given that we want the stuff to be inside PSL2R, we don't want to take a field with one complex place. What we want now to take is a field that's totally real. So it's the same construction as before. Where we now take k is a totally real number field. So um, this is the case when there's no complex embedding, so R2 is zero here. And we take a quaternion algebra B over K that has the ramification property at all but one of these real places. So we take B over K, a quaternion algebra, <coughs> such that B is ramified. all real places except one. And usually, again, I think of k being embedded into r. So I've already chosen, you know, k looks like q of theta. And I'm usually thinking of this as being at the identity place. So then the, then the construction is exactly the same. The point being now that since we're totally real, we're unramified at one particular embedding. And that gives us two by two matrices again. And then we get representations into SL2R rather than SL2C, and we just kind of, we have a little 
thing that we just crank. So it's a little machine there. So then proceed as before. So, you know, what's an example of an arithmetic Fuchsian group? Well, we've seen the modular group that came up in the context of our first discussion. That's the case where the quaternion algebra is simply two by two matrices over the rationals. And perhaps, you know, everybody else's favorite example of a Fuchsian group is, is the two, three, seven triangle group. And again, it's, it's interesting, you know, in the discussion of Craig and Walter, they were telling us about these small volume orbifolds and manifolds that tended to be arithmetic. And this is the smallest volume hyperbolic two orbifold, orientable. And this is also arithmetic. So again, the, somehow the extremal examples somehow have this extra symmetry properties. So here, the field K is Q adjoin cos pi over 7. And um, B over K. So this is degree 3. OK, because if you think of the cyclotonic field of 7 roots of unity, that's got degree 7 minus 1. Uh, don't tell me. That's 6. And then the real subfield of that has got degree 3, because it's 6 over 2. So B over K is, is, is ramified at two real embeddings, or two real places, and no others. So this is an example of an, of an arithmetic Fuchsian group. So the theorem the, whose proof I will sketch, and I'll mention the difficulty in, in, in this part here. Uh, the structure is kind of the same, but there's really some real technical issues that have to be addressed using some number theory here, uh, is the following. The <coughs> it's a theorem. So this was proved a little while ago, some years before this theorem, is that um, if we've got two arithmetic Fuchsian groups with the same length sets, then, then they're commensurable. So two Fuchsian groups with the same length sets. Then they are commensurable. And again, this is commensurable up to, you may have to conjugate. So before I get on to the proof of this, again, as Walter mentioned in his talk, arithmetic hyperbolic three manifolds are kind of sparse in the world of hyperbolic three manifolds of finite volume. Given a, given a number k, there's only finitely many arithmetic hyperbolic guys that have volume bounded by k. And it's a similar statement for arithmetic Fuchsian groups. And it seems to me an interesting question to say that, let's just say, fixed genus of a surface then there are only finitely many arithmetic Fuchsian groups of that particular genus. So there are these magical points in the moduli space of surfaces of genus G that come from arithmetically defined Fuchsian groups. And A, it would be interesting to identify them, and B, it would be interesting to compute asymptotics of how that number grows as the genus goes to infinity. And in fact, In Kang touched on things that were very much in the spirit of that when he was doing this count of the numbers of maximal arithmetic Fuchsian groups in a PSL2R. But uh, yeah, so what the distribution of these arithmetic things in, are in moduli space is kind of an interesting question. Anyway, that's for another day. So let's try and discuss the proof of, of this particular theorem here, that if you've got the same length sets, then, then you're commensurable. And I should add that when you pass to the world of non-arithmetic things, uh, all bets are off. Nothing seems to be known there. The constructions that are known do give you commensurable manifolds. Um, if you go to higher dimensional hyperbolic manifolds, there are results of Prasad and Rappenchuk that tell you that there are hyperbolic five manifolds, arithmetic, with the same length sets, but are not commensurable. 
So this seems to be a low dimensional phenomena. It's got to do with quaternion algebras. And then if you pass to certain kind of higher rank lattices, so for example, lattices say inside SL3R, there's results of Lobotsky, Vizhny, and Samuels that actually construct manifolds that are isospectral but not commensurable. So there are results out there that in indicate that you know, this is a special feature, but uh, how special is still kind of unknown, I think. So let's discuss the proof of this theorem. So the, the first thing is, you know, how in God's green earth do you construct, you know, how do you prove that things are commensurable? Well, again, as Walter alluded to in his first talk, we have the quaternion algebra that gives us this machine to construct arithmetic lattices. And the good thing is, is that the quaternion algebra controls the commensurability class, i.e. two groups are commensurable up to conjugacy if and only if in the arithmetic case their algebras are isomorphic. So to get control, so we use, so I should say this is just a sketch. We, we use the algebra. So it's a theorem that goes back quite some time now to, there's probably lots of Takeuchi, so I won't offend the Japanese. Usually I just put Takeuchi and just leave it at that, but there's probably many, so I'll put, you know, it's K Takeuchi, that says that, you know, gamma 1, gamma 2, arithmetic Fuchsian groups And gamma 1 and gamma 2 are commensurable. Well, let's just write it like this to avoid ambiguity. That H2 mod gamma 1 and H2 mod gamma 2 are commensurable. If and only if um, B1 is isomorphic to B2. So, well, these BIs are the quaternion algebras that you start with to produce these groups gamma 1 and gamma 2. These are basically, the, even though we didn't discuss it in this context, they are the invariant quaternion algebras in this setting. So that's what we need to do. So to prove commensurability, we're, we're going to prove that the algebras are isomorphic. So what we need to do is, from the length set, construct a quaternion algebra. So i.e. we now, so the task, so the task now from the length set construct the quaternion algebra. Okay, then we can be able to apply this. So we're going to show that the length sets determine the isomorphism class of the quaternion algebra, and then we, we apply this theorem. So how do we do this? So that's the next point to address. And again, this really illustrates the sort of the magical power of arithmeticity in the sense that what's going on in the quaternion algebra, the algebra and the arithmetic associated to this quaternion algebra has fantastically powerful control on the geometry of everything that's going on inside these hyperbolic manifolds. And, you know, if there's one thing you could take away from the lectures, or at least my lectures, there's a lot of other better stuff to take away in the other two lecture series. But, you know, the, the little grains that you should take away from my lectures are that some of these quaternion algebras in the number field in the arithmetic setting really in, impose an amazingly strict control on what goes on in the geometry and topology of these manifolds. Okay, so let's see, we're covering the algebra. Right, so if you cast your minds back, let's just go back to the, the start of the, the first lecture yesterday where I discussed um, how if you have a geodesic inside the modular orbifold, it 
was attached to a, a quadratic extension. Namely, you look at the square root of trace squared minus 4, and it was attached to the geodesic. So, so let's just recall that, you know, in, in PSL2Z yesterday, we had, you know, this, this picture here. Here was this geodesic, let's call it G, and this was the axis. So G was the axis of some gamma, and gamma was a el hyperbolic element in the modular group. And associated to this, we associated the um, Q adjoin lambda, where lambda was equal to the trace squared minus 4. Okay, so we attach this quadratic extension to um, this guy. Now, this is true more generally. So, I mean, as we discussed yesterday, in the arithmetic case, you always get a quadratic extension. So, if, if gamma is now an arbitrary arithmetic Fuchsian group, We do the same thing. So here we've got this is a, some axis associated to gamma that projects down to some closed geodesic on our arithmetic orbifold. Then associated to this, we get this quadratic extension, k adjoin lambda, where, where lambda is still the square root of trace squared gamma minus 4. Now, I'm lying slightly here. But anyway, let's not worry too much about what I'm going to say. I mean, this is, this is not a lie, that's for sure. But what I'm going to say shortly is, 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 is slightly lying. We need a game. We should be passing to gamma 2 in all our discussions. But Now, so this is a so k of lambda over k. is equal to 2. And again, let's just take here that k is the center. So b is a quaternion algebra that's defined over the field K. Now, the thing about lambda is that, so gamma is this element we've constructed from looking at the image, say, of an element of norm 1 in an order. So, so gamma looks like P rho of U, where U is some element of a norm 1. So again, that, that, that's a slight lie given the generality stated here. But again, we're only trying to prove commensurability, so we can pass to gamma 2 and not worry too much about this. So then, the characteristic polynomial of U is same as the characteristic polynomial of lambda. So the characteristic polynomial of u equals that of lambda, i.e., again, just from the naturality of traces and how they behave under these maps. We have that u squared minus um, trace of gamma u plus 1 is equal to 0. So u is sitting inside this quaternion algebra, b. So u is an element of b. And so we can consider. the following subset. We can look at k combinations of, well, we can look at um, a plus b u, where a and b belong to k. So this is a subset of b. And what is this? Well, this is just isomorphic to, using the characteristic polynomial, so this is isomorphic to k adjoin lambda. So what I'm trying to say here is that this quadratic extension that we found allows us to define an embedding of that quadratic extension inside the quaternion algebra. So that somehow geodesics here are actually in bijective correspondence with certain quadratic extensions here. I have to be a little bit careful of the center of the quaternion algebra. So this defines a quadratic extension of k that 
embeds in B. So from a hyperbolic element, we've constructed a quadratic extension that embeds inside B. So the theorem that is needed is to go the other way. And this uses the theory of quaternion algebras plus number theory, in particular the structure of unit groups of number fields. It basically says that, in fact, quadratic extensions that embed in the algebra, if they're of the right kind, give rise to hyperbolic elements in arithmetic groups. So, so the little theorem that comes from the, from the theory of quaternion algebras and the unit groups of number fields is that, um, so as I said, the, it's only certain quadratic extensions of the field K that works. So K here is totally real. So if we look at quadratic extensions, they could be complex. So they could be an imaginary quadratic extension. If you think of Q, you can go to Q adjoined square root of minus D, a complex extension of degree 2. Or you could go to a Q root D where D was positive, a real quadratic extension. And it's only the real ones that I'm going to think about. And again, that should be visible from here because lambda is a, a real eigenvalue because we're dealing with hyperbolic elements. So that's a real quadratic extension of K. So. So let's let um, L be a real quadratic extension of K. Uh, then um, L embeds in B. So meaning there's an isomorphism of L into B. So we're sending the element that's a primitive element for this number field to some element of the quaternion algebra. L embeds in B isomorphically. If and only if, well, we can find um, an element in O1 such that um, that element of O1 generates this in the same way we have here. So L embeds in B if and only if. Um, there exists a, a U in O1. So if for some order, so let's just say for some order O, it doesn't really matter. As Walter mentioned, all the orders are commensurable, so it doesn't really matter here. So for some order O, there exists a U in O1 such that um, L looks like K adjoin U, so exactly in this picture here. So over here, for the hyperbolic elements, we constructed a quadratic extension that we could see lived inside the quaternion algebra. And what this says is that that's exactly what happens. So this is a very powerful piece of information. And so again, what are we trying to do? We're trying to reconstruct the quaternion algebra from lengths. So now we've translated the lengths to a statement about quadratic extensions. And then the next little key thing, so this is key theorem one that's needed to be proven, and then sort of key theorem two, that again uses just the structural theory of quaternion algebras, is that, um, is that, um, that if we've got gamma one and gamma two as in the hypothesis, so they had the same, uh, sorry, yeah, so we have gamma one and gamma two, then, um, B1 and B2 that associated quaternion algebras are isomorphic if and only if the collection of these quadratic extensions that embed in B1 is the same as those that embed in B2. So let me introduce a piece of notation. So notation. So let's let, so bi, again, b over ki, the quaternion algebras associated to gamma 1 and gamma 2, then um, if we let script li to be the collection of L over k quadratic, real extensions 
of Ki that embed in Bi. Okay, so it's just these these collections here that we're looking at. So the theorem, key theorem here now is that um, that B1 is isomorphic to B2 if and only if L1 equals L2. So that B1 is isomorphic to B2 if and only if L1 equals L2. So this is the, the next piece of information that's needed to, again, construct the isomorphism class. So again, what was our task? The theorem of Takeuchi said to construct commensurability, we need to reconstruct an isomorphism at the level of a quaternion algebras. We've now translated that to a statement about the real quadratic extensions of the center that embed inside the quaternion algebra. And we've seen that these are connected to the collection of lengths of closed geodesics on the manifold. So let's just finish off the, again, I'm not going to say anything more about this. Let, let me just kind of finish the proof. So the first thing to perhaps remark is that, well, if the, if the algebras are going to be isomorphic, then the centers better be isomorphic. So they should be the same field. So let's just check that, you know, K1 is equal to K2. So why is that true? Well, um, we're given the length sets. And so lengths just look like, you know, log of the eigenvalue. So, you know, the lengths look like um, log or twice the log of, of lambda. Now, the only discrepancy here in the real case is just a sign. Okay. So if we've got the lengths, that determines the traces of the hyperbolic elements associated to the up to sign. And so in particular, that determines the traces squared. And as pointed out earlier today, the field generated by traces squared, that's just the invariant trace field. So this implies that if we know that all of these are the same, this implies that K1 equals So, um, so now we're getting the quadratic extensions, getting L1 equal to L2, and hence this implies the theorem. So, so if we've got some gamma in gamma 1, and again, we should really sort of be passing to things that are, you know, in the right place. But anyway, let's not worry too much about that right now. So if we've got gamma and gamma 1, then um, this gives us some, some length, of course. And in particular, that defines some quadratic extension of the center. So this determines a quadratic extension. This determines an L equal to, so let's call the common field here equal to K. So this determines a quadratic extension that embeds inside B. Okay, that's the first part over here. Now, we're going to use the converse direction of that theorem, that because we've got the same length set, so same length set, implies that there exists some, you know, gamma 2 in gamma 2 with trace of gamma equal to um, trace of gamma 2, okay, up to sign again. But now, that means we've got the same quadratic extension. And now we apply the other direction here. So we've got this element here. So we've got this quadratic extension, and we've got this element that generating a quadratic extension. So must, this field L must actually embed inside B2. So this implies that L embeds inside B2. So what we've seen is that we've got L in B1, and now L embeds in B2. So this implies that L1 is contained in L2, and so and conversely. Just using, again, an application of these theorems here to, ah, sorry, not this one. The application of this theorem here to pass between quadratic extensions of the centers and the hyperbolic elements. So now we've got L1 equals L2, and then this implies um, B1 isomorphic to B2. And, uh, How do you know all this quadratic 
Well, that's because of this, right? So once we've got a length, we've got an element, and that determines a quadratic extension. So everything is completely determined. So a quadratic extension determines a length, and a, a length determines a quadratic extension. The all quadratic real extensions. So all quadratic real extensions comes from K. K. Yeah, that's exactly right. So that's what this theorem is saying here, basically. So that's exactly right. It's really up to rational multiples, even. That you don't really care if you take gamma or gamma to the power of 100. They generate the same quadratic extension that embeds inside the quaternion algebra. So that's kind of the power here that gets control of our length sets. Okay, so um, what time did I start? I forgot when I started. Well, whatever time I started, it's pretty clear that I'm not going to be able to do anything kind of reasonable now. Let me just check here if there's anything else. Yeah, so perhaps that's perhaps the right place to stop. Okay. Thanks.